No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and today we're having to sit down with a legend, an icon in fashion and the overall culture. Jeff Hamilton is in the building. Thank you, my friend. Glad to be here. Yeah, man. Super excited to have you here. And for, for the real fans, they'll know that T-Rail right here got a surprise jacket gifted to him on episode of At the End of the Day Live, and Jeff Hamilton was brought up. That's got to be one of the best gifts, I have to say, that I've ever seen a spouse Give to their lover. Live on the show. On the show. The jacket and the man. And mm -hmm. the man. And the man is like super, super monumental out here in the culture. For real. Like he's he's delivered jackets to like the biggest celebrities and the biggest athletes in the world. So it was cool to see him sort of stoop down and fuck with the common folk <laughs> over here at No Jumper, right? Let's not forget that everybody was all color coordinated also. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> everybody in orange. And... Did she send you a note when she uh, roped you into that deal? Like, you got to wear orange? No, I was not wearing orange myself. I mean, like, oh. I knew the jacket was... I didn't know that she was going to wear orange. Everybody's going to wear orange but uh you know I, I think you know it was kind of discreet that they were all yellow i think you know so mm. so the yellow and orange oh, it was yellow yeah well, you know? but it still looked cool you know how yeah, a whole little cool. honeycomb look nice and warm colors i feel like the man that day you kind of were yeah i, I was did. watching I, that i felt like, like the man that was a, that was a cool ass moment yeah that was a cool moment thank you man i'll never forget that moment ever in my thank life you for the opportunity definitely yes. So, uh, okay, let, let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing so we can hope to understand uh, how you came to be. So I'm, I'm born in Africa. I mean, uh, so I'm an official or real African-American, in case you want to know. Okay. Uh, so I was born in, in Morocco, North Africa, and uh, left, uh, left Morocco when I was 10 years old, moved to France, and was raised in France. You know, went to school and did my studies. And Do you remember being hit with a, a culture shock when you left and went to France and what was that like for you at the time? Uh, it was a little bit different, you know, I mean, just growing up, you know, I mean, like I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish, you know, just being in France, it was not like, you felt like a lot of discrimination mm. in, in the schools, you know, even the, some of the other kids were maybe two or three Jewish kids in the in the classroom. You know, they had to to hide the fact that they were Jewish because they didn't want it like, a, you know, there was like, we're talking about like probably a, uh, I moved to France in 1967, so I'm, for the record, I'm going to be 67 in, in a couple of weeks, so, mm. so I'm waiting for the delivery of a jacket at Tyrell if you want to now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I got you. Uh, You're going to bring you a fitted hat. So, um, <laughs> so I was, um, you know, so, so there was a little bit like a, a, a little challenge, which in a way sometimes, you know, and, and, and it, it sounds maybe... I don't know, maybe difficult to understand, but sometimes adversity makes you stronger and makes you want to be, uh, give extra effort. You know, the same way like uh, the immigrants, when they come to America, you see they, they, they double work because they want to mm. just try to find a way to get assimilated and, and get even better and just make a push. So even when you see every, every new first generation of, of uh, immigrants to come to America, you, you pretty much you see them, I would say the majority get successful because they really feel discriminated against because of their upbringing and, and coming into a different country, learning a new language, new new values. And uh, so so I basically went to school and basically was, I mean, I nothing negative about it, but I was a nerd. Right. I mean, I worked very hard. I mean, I wanted to make my parents proud. I mean, I wanted to make sure I had good grades. And, uh, and I just focused a lot on, on my studies, which was math and physics. I was not a very... Uh, social kind of guy i mean didn't party going up i didn't never heard about what weed was was at the time <laughs> or anything like that and uh, or, or or drinking or anything like that. i mean it was just basically a, a good boy trying to to hustle in work and but with a lot of big dreams but looking back at that time period do you see the the creative spirit in you or had that not been discovered yet i don't I, I don't think I did no maybe I mean I was I was painting for myself and everybody mm. liked what I did but it was not I never thought I was going to be an artist or a painter or, or a designer I mean at that time and through through my my growth I really wanted to you know basically being the Jewish doctor in the family the know? pressure so to, was. the pressure to conform must have been far more intense than what the average American experiences in, in 2022 right yeah, but again, it's 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 France. It was mm -hmm. not America. You know, 
for some reason, you can be as intense as you want to be, but you can be, uh, or you can be relaxed as, as much as you want to be. But friends, it was that, that kind of like drive, you know, because, you know, they, they, you know, obviously being Jewish, you know, you had the French who were pre-me, I would say the majority were anti-Semitic, and then you had the Muslim, which were friends in the school, but it's a big part of it, you know, but there was that, it was not as open that now, I mean, all my friends are Muslim or they're Hindus or they, and we, we really have a great armor. We get together very well. We, we get along very well. Then there was like the whole super political stuff that a Jewish and, a, and an Arab cannot get together. So right. there was always that, that uh, those tensions, you know. But right. uh, so I was really focused on, on working and, and on my school and doing math and physics. I wanted to become, you know, a, a doctor. From a doctor, I wanted to become a, maybe a pilot later. And then uh, ultimately, I, I set up my dreams. I was going to become a CPA. That's what I wanted to do. Oh, really? My dream was to become a CPA. <laughs> <laughs> so Who put you on to the, the attorney game? The attorney? Or the, that's doctor. A, oh. Accountant. <laughs> Edit that out. Accountant. <laughs> accountant. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what does CPA stand for? I thought it was corporate. Certified, cor certified so, public attorney, accountant. Right. Certified public accountant. Right? Yeah, yeah that's exactly what you say, Adam. Oh, okay. <laughs> but who, who turned you on to that? Uh, no, my, my mother and my, my father was an accountant, and my mother. They were not CPAs, they were accountants and mm -hmm. bookkeepers. And, and I kind of like always had that crazy love for. For numbers, and I still do. I mean, I still love numbers. I still do my accounting myself, and I love numbers. And something that's that's a passion for me. Like I, I can play games with numbers, and as long as my brain is stimulated, I'm a happy man. Right. Um, okay. So, what, what was the rest of high school like, or what did you, when did you start to explore something beyond that? So, growing up, I mean, I always had that dream of uh, of America. That that was. A constant really? uh, after maybe at the age of 11, 12 years old, uh, and I really dreamt of America. For me, it was like the, the promised land, and I always dreamt about everything. So I had family that was living in Houston and uh, in Ohio. So uh, so I, I made sure they sent me like the the college T-shirts, and I would love to wear it. And and I told them, I used to tell you know when I started meeting some girls, I told them my my real name was not Jeff, you know my. I, I was born Joseph, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of switched right away my name to Jeff. So I wanted people to tell them, you know, like I'm, I have an American flair to me and things like that. And uh, and I love, obviously, like, you know, I'm much older than you guys. So for me, rock and roll is a big deal, you know, like the Rolling Stones and, and, and the Beatles and and all the eras with Led Zeppelin and and cream and all so for me it was a, a big influence I, I love music because i like him like i said i was kind of a loner I was not uh, out there like uh, mr popular and uh, and also and, and i love basketball i mean i just start looking at basketball there was we didn't have youtube we didn't have phones we didn't, mm. in fact i had till the age of 18 i mean i had a tv uh, uh which was only a black and white tv and never had color and time, you'd be able so. to catch some basketball reruns never, here and there never never, <laughs> never watch basketball however right. i knew about I went to a store and one time I found a poster of uh, of Jerry West and a poster of uh, uh, Will Chamberlain, a poster of uh, Lou Alcindor. So for me, I had those posters on my wall as inspiration. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was with uh, Jerry West and I was telling him the story, and uh, it was pretty uh, it was pretty uh, kind of like uh, amazing for me to to have dreamt about having that and me sitting with Jerry West in his home and and chopping it up, you know, about all the different things and basketball and all the dreams that I had and, right. and becoming a, a reality. So how did you actually end up making your way to America? So um, I love France as, as a country. I think it's beautiful. I mean, it's so much beautiful culture. I, 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 did, I didn't fit in it, you know. I mean, I mm. just didn't fit in it, not only through as I evolve, you know, like uh, not through through what the, the, the problems I had in school when I was young, but really... Uh, I didn't like the whole uh, family uh, dynamics, you know, like even the Jewish families, you know, they were very controlled. Not my parents, but like all the rest were controlling. There was a lot of jealousy. There was never a way. I knew there was no way out for me. Mm -hmm. Either I was going to become, even if I became an accountant, I would have a job, a nine-to-five job. I was going to be, and, and I really, at that point, I started becoming super ambitious. You know, I, got, I, got, I, m I met my, my first wife when I was 17 years old. And I got married when I was 19. Huh. And so even though her parents were 
in business. They were not majorly successful, but their, their father was in business. They were doing some stuff. So he kind of opened an eye for me where I wanted to, to, to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to do things. I just wanted to have, you know, a car. So as soon as I, you know, I was 18, I mean, I was went out and, I, and for somewhere by hustling and doing sweat meats and buying frying pans and selling frying pans and, and all kind of like hustle and doing different things. Uh, I ended up buying a Mercedes when I was 19 years old. Like it was like, listen, it's not the Mercedes that the way we have here, but it was like an old beat up diesel Mercedes. But for me, I had a Mercedes it was like the, the symbol of it. And, uh, and then I said, you know, I don't care. You know, I'm, I don't have a lot of money. Um, so I opened a jean store, actually, when I was 19 years old, 18 years old. I opened a jean store in a small neighborhood of Paris. Making your own jeans? No, no. I was oh. buying uh, uh, Levi's and Wranglers and Lee and other brands, you know, and, uh, and local uh, European brands. And, and listen, I was making a living, but I was not making any money and but I, I love the space I love the fashion idea of it and and I always felt like I had a, a good taste for some reason I mean that's my own personal feeling I felt like I had good taste I knew how to put things together mm. but never thought I would be a designer so I, I started dreaming about becoming a designer I started buying, taking like a tracing paper buying magazines a uh, fashion magazine and tracing the shapes and creating my own jeans my own shirt my own sweaters and and painting over with like markers and and it was like kind of like you know i wish i had this pieces every because those are amazing and uh and i dreamed about having a jean brand in america that was a great thing you know i just want to do it and and i made the decision was when i when i got married i was like 20 years old and that I didn't want to live in America. I wanted to. I didn't want to live to, in France. I wanted to move to America. You know, of course, it took me a few years back. You know, you know, I moved when I was 24 years old. Mm. Again, and building up my resentment for people trying to restrict me and try to control me, not being able for me to to succeed. Uh, but I, I, at that point, at that point before I left, I was hustling. I had like 10 different spaces of, of sweat meat. I had the the, the store in, in 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 Paris and. And I was just basically doing whatever. And I gave up my, my schooling. You know, I went first year to become a CP after graduate from math and physics uh, uh, schools. And then, uh, and I really wanted to, 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 to be uh, an entrepreneur and working. So I, I decided I was going to make the move to come to America. So I, I, came, to, uh, I came to New York with a friend. And uh, just, just a side question. I feel like if, as a designer, and in particular these days, maybe it wasn't like this so much then, but you, you kind of have like a customer in mind or a subculture in mind that you sort of want to be your target market for what you're selling. Who did you feel like you were designing for at that time? Just just the everyday person? Definitely not for the culture. I mean, for me, it was I, I didn't even know what it meant or anything like that. Uh, in fact, like my first brand when I came out, the first idea, the, the idea that I want to do it, uh, I really felt like... Um, I'm, I'm not a homosexual, but I, you know, obviously, I have no no issues at all with homosexual thing. But I, I, I felt like at the time during like the what was it the the, the group like uh, village people. I felt like there was such a big trend with the disco and the whole thing that we felt like I was going. My first gene, there was a gene called Ulala, you know. And of course, Sassoon took that after that. It was Ulala, and and the idea I really felt even the logo. It was like in my mind was a whole California dreaming with the sunset and the sun coming down and all those. Colors like the OP OP colors, Ocean Pacific colors, and and the idea, the gimmick on the jean was when you bought a jean, you had a, you had a bandana like a real bandana attached directly to the back of the jean. Oh, he does that too. Yeah, yeah but but it was you, you, you would. Go, <laughs> no, I don't. On the I don't. right, or on the left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he knows. No, I don't know. On the left, on the left, on the left. So so that's kind of like ideas that I wanted to and uh, so I come to so I, I basically made the move pissed off the whole family took my two kids and my my wife my first wife and came to America I, I had six thousand dollars at the time when I came which is you know you can say it's a lot of money it was not a lot of money 19 1980 when I moved in it still it was not a lot not money. a lot of money to Transplant your entire family to a new family. country. <laughs> and listen, I mean, even, even though today you cannot get an apartment for like that two, three grand, whatever it is, I assume. Right. I mean, I moved to Tarzana. My, my apartment was six seventy-five 
$6 rent, you know? Uh, a month, you know, you have to get first and last, and I had to buy a car, and they're buying a $800 Maverick, you know? Mm. And, uh, and, and so, you come over here, and is it just like the most overwhelming, confusing shit on earth, or did you yeah. just fall right into it? No, completely overwhelming. I mean, like, I didn't know nothing about, anything about it. Right. I mean, I, I said I need to make money. I, I, nobody wants to hire me. I mean, I, I, my goal, my, my, my motto was, I'm moving to America, I'm not coming back. Mm. Even in and my, my idea of, during the time of the movie car wash, I say I'll go and wash cars if I have to. Right. I, I work as a car wash, you know, car wash if I have to. Whatever needs to be done for me to make a living and support my family was there. I remember like spending money for my kids, and I remember going downtown and trying to find thing. I knew that my budget was a dollar a day, mm. you know, for me to to eat. So I mean, I would go to uh, to one of those uh, Mexican. Uh, bodega and just get like a, a burrito with beans and rice and just eat it that's it you know and and uh, <laughs> i love that but, uh, you still but, do that <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, can, I could do that i mean i wouldn't have n nothing is above you know i'm not better than that so but uh, but i'm just picturing in my head like when i first went to france you know it's overwhelming how the fuck do i get around what should, what should i eat like you know never mind the idea of having to get an apartment and figure out how to make money and you have a, a wife and kids like yeah, i mean you so, must have really wanted it no. so bad that you were willing to I go without i mean i had some friends at the time that i had met when i when i did my travels you know which i met they kind of direct me i mean keep in mind that i spoke a little english i, I didn't speak English. I'm not saying that speaking well, but at least you kind of understand me. Right. But um, I came completely illegal, by the way, also. I didn't have a green card. I came in on, on a tourist visa. I was 100% illegal, you know, like, and I say, basically, I'm coming in and I'm crashing. And, you know, and <laughs> if the immigration find me, they'll deport me. You <laughs> right. know, that's super interesting that you come from uh, Paris, France, where, you know, and it seemed like you don't, you didn't have a lot of background, you know, in fashion, like you super self-taught. And this is like the soup, the motherland of fashion, like where all the fashion houses are, where, where all the creators are, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it breeds fashion. So, yeah, but know. did you think of it that way back then? I mean, it was in different circle. I mean, different things. Mm. You know, keep in mind, I mean, like, like, uh, from a very humble, um, lifestyle. My parents were very, my parents were very honest, hardworking people. We live very modestly. We didn't have any, I don't remember going to a restaurant maybe, maybe once a year. We used to go and have a little lunch somewhere, but most of the time it was our meals at home. We never, there was never even going out and getting a coffee in a, in a, in a rest, in a bar. And I feel like you you had that idea in your head like america is a place where you can make it from nothing you can build something whereas like out in europe it's more austerity it's more like you kind of it's understood that you're not gonna just r raise rise to a way different level in society whereas at that time in america that was the dream i'm not sure to what extent that dream is still yeah, alive for, for people dream, but i still think it is it's, it has not changed uh, mm. you know uh, so like i said previously um, my first goal was to go to to new york and and I started going through New York, and I was overwhelmed with New York. Loved it, everything. I felt like the energy, and and Dev decided to go. But then, at the time, I made my first wife come in with my son. At, he was the only one I was born, and and uh, and I started walking with the, 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 the stroller in the street, walking, walking through Fifth Avenue, and the people. But I didn't see one kid. Mm. I didn't see one kid for like like ten minutes. And I said, Is that the way I want to raise my kids here? Right. Or am I going to go to the suburbs and take a two-hour train every day in the morning, two-hour train? And so I kind of give up the idea and decide I'm going to California. I came to California and I felt like I don't care. I don't care if I don't have, if I'm not successful, as long as I can support my family. Just the beauty of being driving and going to see the ocean and having the sunshine and having the comfort and the big cars and and I really felt like there was such a uh, a connection with me and California, and, and, and I loved it, and I still do. So, how, how, oh, sorry, you go ahead. I, I just wanted to say, uh, what, what kept you motivated in fashion when you, once you came to uh, California? Um, I had no motivation of fashion right at that stage. You know, at that stage, I wanted to, I wanted to work. And if somebody to give me a job as a, as a bookkeeper, I would have taken it. Somebody gave me a job as construction, I would have taken. I mean, for me, I, I need to. My first priority was just to go out and, 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 and support my family. So I really tried for like three, four months 
to try to, try to get a job. I mean, I moved in actually February 14, 1980 to America. By June, I couldn't find. And I finally, I met somebody that was in a clothing business, and I said, I kept on begging and begging, pretty much calling five, six times a day. And, and just to say, get me a job of any kind, you know? And uh, ultimately, the guy answered the phone and said, you're so persistent, you know, there, there must be something out there. So why don't you come? I kind of give you a job. But if you want here is I have a bunch of closeouts, sell them. So I got really excited, and I just basically started going up and down every single store that all around downtown, around all the areas, making phone calls and just tried to sell as much as I could. I sold out everything like very quickly. Uh, I went to get my money, and he said, well, we're not shipping the goods till September, so when we ship the goods, then we pay you commission. So that was a big disappointment. But at that point, I already had infiltrated like the streets. So I knew the stores, I had the developed relationship with different people, some French, some Jewish guys that, that, that I had. But that in a different, nothing to do with fashion, mostly with clothes out and, and jobbing, you buy a, a, an old end of series. And so I started going and start hustling. I mean, I went to somebody that, had, that was a printer that was making t-shirts and I said, well, here, I know this guy has those, those shirts from that store, I know this guy's a printer. I'm gonna get those shirts and print and sell to this guy in the middle. And, and I, I make $1, $2 a piece, you know, I make uh, 50 bucks, 50 bucks. And, and, and I started doing like that. And one thing led to the other, and I started getting, hitting a couple of really good deals. Uh, and, uh, and actually, I, 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 I ended up making good money. I mean, like very, like in 19, uh, 1981, 1982, I started making really good money to the point I even bought a house. Uh, and I mean, I, the house was $260,000 in, in, uh, in Encino. I mean, it came up with, at the time, $26,000, which was amazing. I bought, uh, I had a friend of mine who had a Mercedes, you know, wanted me to take over the lease, it was $350, I, I took over the lease. Uh, I bought my ex-wife like, like a, like a you know, Wells Fargo. So I felt like I was already making it, you know, and, but, uh, but, not one dollar in the bank. But Everything. you're making a lot of money through having a store, or just because no, you're doing just, so just many of these. No, just hustling in the street. I right. Mean, no, no tax returns. No, nothing like that. It was all kind of like everything in cash. I make money. I go in. I pay for it. I be young. But you know, and that's and at the time, I mean, you could buy a house. You didn't have to qualify. I mean, I, I think I probably took over. Uh, an existing loan that was existing from somebody. At the time, you could assume loan. If somebody had a house, you take over the loan, you make the payments, that was, that was it. So I ended up doing that. Uh, and then, uh, then, I opened, and then I opened like a, a, an actual uh, office in downtown Los Angeles, actually. Uh, I don't know if where the Ace Hotel is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a building. There was a, nothing but manufacturing, like all Mexicans and Korean manufacturers there. And it, I have a 400 square feet uh, uh, store where basically it was my, my, my base for me just to go out and, and buy clothes out, sell them. And I was, at that point, I had actually an office. Was this before or after you came the creative director for Guest Jeans? I was not the creative director. I was the owner of Guest yeah, Jeans. You, started you was the owner. Yeah. I, was a, I, I was a creative director of the men's. But I own, I own 100% of the men's company. I was a founder of the men's Guest Jeans for Men. That, that was before. So in that building, as I was going through the building, uh, I ran into a guy that was always super well-dressed. And it happened to be French. And... And at that time, I, you know, I, I started building confidence at that time. You know, at that time, I started building confidence. Uh, you know, I'm starting suddenly to kind of look better physically, you know. I'm not as much the nerd I used to be growing up in France. Um, well, you're getting used to America. I'm getting used to say America. I'm getting, I'm getting used to ladies giving attention to me. Mm. I, I never was into drugs, never smoked, never drank a drop of alcohol, never gambled. Wow. And, you know, but suddenly, listen, growing up a nerd, you see like those supermodels like in the fashion district that are looking up to me and you know kind of falling in a trap as well they want to drink but, we're but drinking I, but as long as i'm <laughs> as long as i'm but i'm but i'm dressing well i'm uh -huh. dressing well at that point you know i mean you're talking about like 82 i'm wearing like pink sweaters with the matching pink socks and and the loafers and and really cool jeans but but i'm not at all a designer i'm i'm a basically uh, a cap a hustler with a capital h selling 
close out whatever it is. I mean, I don't care whatever it is come from. I don't know if the stuff is real. I don't know if there's counterfeit. I don't care. I want to make a living at that point. I mean, there's no, there was not that many guidelines. Even though I, I, I grew up as a super straight up guy, I, I like honest and, and for me at that point, I wanted to succeed. There was no, you know, if I, if I sold some Ralph Ryan uh, knockoff shirt at the time, the polo shirt, so be it. I, I didn't care. Mm. I mean, I didn't want to go too deep into it to know it. That it was making a buck. So as I was going in the elevator up and down, and I saw that guy, and it was just start becoming friends. And what do you do? Bam, bam, I do this. Oh, I'm starting a new clothing line, which is a shirt. And I find out that, that of course, that guy was George Marciano, the founder of Guest Jeans, of, the, of the, the, the whole brand. And he was by himself at the time. He was, he was not even his brothers were not part of it. And, uh, and he had started a woman's line of just white shirts only, but like different beautiful shirts. Uh, and he just had left France, moved to America because, you know, at the time they had, the whole family had huge, they had 15 stores. They were successful in France, very successful in France, like fancy cars and homes and all the stuff. Even when they moved here, they had beautiful cars and Beverly Hills places and all that stuff. But, uh, but they owed a lot of money to the taxes in France. So they had to, at the time, they had to run away from, from the country because taxing authorities wanted to grab them. Right. Uh, so, so him and I became friends, and we developed a friendship. That's it. You know, nothing like that, but just politely friendship. And uh, certain uh, circumstances happened that his brother, when his brother came in, one of his brothers moved in. Uh, his kid was in the same school as my kid. And my ex-wife and his wife became best friends, who became really super best friend as a family. At that time, I had my two kids, and, and he had a son and a daughter, I had a son and a daughter. My son had three days difference with his son, his daughter, my daughter had a, a, a one month difference with their, with their daughter. And, uh, and we really were basically five, six days together, having dinner, having dinner at my home, dinner at their house. And uh, I was not happy doing what I was doing with the, the, the jobbing, thing because I had a partner that I had the, 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 the eye of the tiger and the rage of six, uh, to succeed. Uh, at that time, 1982, I'm like 26 years old, you know, like uh, 26, 27 years old. Uh, and my partner at the time was 42, 43 years old, 45 years old. And he, come in, he came in from, from a job of being uh, a rep in the clothing business, very nice guy. But suddenly, he started, we started making some money. But for me, it was not enough. But we started making money. So he bought himself a nice uh, Mercedes convertible. And the guy, but the guy is like already a seasoned um, <laughs> lazy person. I mean, I don't, say that. I don't <laughs> be negative in that way. But, right. but the guy was, he wanted the good life already you know I, for me i didn't want a good life i just wanted to continue working till i started living the life you know? it, and yeah. uh, so so it was like three days in palm springs and every night was like uh, uh, the poker games and mm. you come in at 12 o'clock in the morning uh, at 12 o'clock i was eight o'clock in the office it was good come at 12 o'clock so there was a, a whole big thing like you know and then I, I come in for one hour he will tell me the whole story oh i had that hand in poker and i did that and for me, I was focused. I just <laughs> want to work, and and I wanted to, you know, at that t during that time, I tried to develop a brand called Golf, G O L F F, which was kind of like a, a knockoff of the Ralph Lauren shirt, but instead of the the, the, the horse, the polo player was a, a golfer with a swing. And at that time, I had a vision to actually trademark that stuff, and you know, he didn't believe in it. You know, I wanted just to really go out and sell all the, the department stores and. And be an alternative to 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 the polo shirt. Polo shirt with thirty two dollars whole retail at the time. I want to sell mine for like fifteen dollars retail, you know. Mm. But really make a volume twenty five dollars, thirty dollars. I didn't care. So, going back, uh, uh, fast forward again to 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 to, to Marciano. So I became friends with a friend, and 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 I was really tired of this partner. I mean, even so, we kind of decide to break up. So I told him, either you buy me out, either I buy you out, but I cannot go on, you know, and and. I'm glad that he bought me out because otherwise I would, and when I mean buy me out, I think it gave me $10,000 for me to, to walk away from the company, which the company right. didn't last two months after that because I was still the heart of the company without sounding like a, a too pretentious there. But, uh, and, uh, and I approached uh, the, the Marcianos. I said, I really want to do something. You guys doing, guest started already. You know, so, so the transition from the shirt 
they started the genes. And the origin why he started the genes because George himself had, his three brothers had boutiques which became the guest stores, but they had only two boutiques, in, in one in the Century City and one in, in Beverly Hills on Santa Monica Boulevard called M, uh, uh, MGA. And uh, so he was making jeans to sell to them. Mm. He figured, like, listen, I already have my brother going to buy jeans for me, so at least I know I'm, I, I have a guaranteed uh, production already. And, uh, and the jean came out spectacular. You know, they came in with a real strand with a zipper on the side, and it was like a really amazing wash, amazing fabric. Very talented. I don't get along with them at all. I mean, like, I don't. We don't like each other. I mean, I, I, I could say, I'm not going to say we hate each other, but on my end, I don't hate it, but we really dislike each other very much. How many I years since it. you talked? Um, it, it's been on and off, you know, like, mm. like with George, you know, we, I love George, actually. Uh, I still do, because I, obviously for me, I, I always look up to him as, as kind of my, my inspiration of how I came about uh, becoming a designer and learning a lot from him, from all the things from like my first Osmar Piguet that I bought in 1982 or 83 uh, was like, because I'd never heard of Osmar Piguet before I heard from him. And I knew it, like the only thing that turned me on to it was like only for the people who know. So I, and, and, I, and I have, and I still wear, that's my original. I mean, I have a lot of watch, but I wear that one is kind of like very symbolic to me. Uh, and it was like, yeah, they were very, because they made so much money in France originally, they were very rounded in, in, in uh, culturally. I was very well educated uh, in, in all the sense of, of knowledge, but I was not culture. I was not sophisticated. I didn't know about the good things. I didn't know about the designers. I didn't know about art. I didn't know, I mean, I knew some of it, but not as much as, and I learned a lot from George. And Why did you so, guys end up severing ties? Sorry? Why did you guys end up like severing ties? Um, because I came in, I, I started at that point in 1983. So I basically, like, I, I went to them. I said, you know, what, let, you guys are doing $2 million a year in, in a woman's. Why don't you do men's? They said, why don't you come and work for us? And I said, you know, I have never worked for anybody. Even when I work as a salesman to the guy, the other guy, the first job, I was like independent, you know? So I never worked for anybody. And I just want to be on my own. And I really have not worked for anybody in my life uh, since. Uh, so they said, we'll give you, I'm talking about 1982, 1983, we'll give you $2,000 a week, which is probably the equivalent of 20 grand a week to work. <laughs> and, and, and I said, uh, no, I'd rather take, and I'd rather t do it on my own. And uh, so I knew, I knew the concept of licensing that was not a very well common practice in America. You know, people know at a certain level with Bill Blass and Pierre Cardin and some of the brands like that. That was way before the Calvin Kleins and the Jordache of the world and things like that. So I knew the concept of licensing. I told them, why don't you give me a license and I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And through convincing and some stuff like that, I was able to get the licensing. So I founded the men's company. I own 100% of the licensing company, but they own the brand. I didn't come up with the name. Right, yes, okay. They own the brand. I licensed the name from them. Uh, at that point, I started the company with $22,000. I told, I lied to everybody. I told them I had $80,000. That was a big lie. <laughs> In order for me to make my financial statements to look like I could get credit. And, right. You know, I played all the tricks in the books for me to try to, to, to make it happen. And... Uh, and here I am. I have uh, my uh, four, five hundred square feet in the same building, by the way, and guests in the same building. But at the time, also, we all in the same building still, and in, in the old Ace building. In fact, if you see like uh, the original guest label, it has 801, 803, which is the suite numbers where they started the business. Wow. So, uh, so how big did you grow this? So I, I, I started the business in, in with twenty-two thousand dollars, and here I am. I have no knowledge. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have never designed a thing in my life. I mean, I knew about ideas, and or I would take like the polo shirt and give it to somebody. I say, make a polo shirt for me. I want it in ten different colors. That I could do, but right. me manufacturing from scratch and knowing about washes, and I didn't even know you needed a pattern for to to make to make clothing. Right. So I hired the guy that used to be the freight elevator operator. He said, I, I, I know fashion, I know, I'm a pattern maker, I know to do this, and, and I, knew, I had to make samples, so I hired him, and basically started working and designing it, and, and there was a big hype about the name Guest. Even though they were very small, they had such a hype to build up the brand. So what I did was, uh, 
I went and reached out to, to Bloomingdale's because they were very successful with the women's and, and Saks. And uh, I finally convinced Saks to buy 24 pieces from me. And that was uh, uh, March 1980. Uh, and I started a company January 15, 1980. And so, I saw 24 pieces, you know, it's not a lot. You know, I mean, keep in mind, the jeans were not 300 bucks, they were $24 a piece at the time. Uh, but I want to make sure that they sold out. So as soon as I shipped the goods in the store, I had buddies of mine in New York, mm. buddies of mine in Beverly Hills, we went out, we cleaned up, we bought everything at retail. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and so we had an amazing set through. So the ne next morning, the, the buyer, I remember his name was Mohammed, like was a Pakistani guy. And he calls me and says, Jeff, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning, 7.30 in the morning, you know, I want to talk to you. We've just put the goods in the store, and we had a pretty good sell-through. I mean, you know, it's okay. We're not, like, you know, perfect, but... But you already knew they were completely well, sold out. They, they, <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't voluntarily make for sold out. The, right. the size 28, I left it open, and size 38, I, I left it open. So nobody bought the big size, mm. small size. You know, they sold maybe a couple of pieces, but I ended up probably buying another 48 piece, probably about 35 or 40 pieces, you know? And uh, so, so we'd like to maybe test it maybe on, at the time they had 50 stores or something like that. We'd like to test it maybe like in 15 stores and we'd like to give you another 80 pieces. I'm sorry, I would love to, but I'm, I'm completely sold out. Right. <laughs> so, so say, what? Well, and that's certainly like, they, they, they think they're doing me a favor. And, you know, and so they, they, I said, I'm sold out. I say, uh, I already took a big order for Blo Blooming Death, which was not true, by the way. So, right. and, uh, say, but, 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 you know, how, how about we buy, we buy for all the stores? I give you 1,200 pieces. I say, but I already sold, I'm sold out. I cannot ship you goods till, till, till June or July. And to make a long story short, I say, well, you know, let me see what I can do. You know, bam, 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 bam. I might, my, my, I might have to take it from Bloomingdale's and give it to you. I said, but what we'll do is we'll put some ads in the, the New York Times. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And, and fast forward, you know, obviously they gave me a 1,200 piece order that obviously took over. So July, uh, uh, April, I did 17,000. By August, I was doing already $150,000 a month. Uh huh. Like by August uh, uh, 1980, January I was doing uh, six hundred thousand dollars in sales. Wow! Uh, that January eighty one, uh, eighty four, uh, January eighty five I did uh, five million one. And so, how long did it and take? And nineteen eighty five did seventy five million dollars. How long did it take before they started regretting? Uh allow right me away. to have this much control right, right, right away. Because yeah. right yeah, because... this is like an unheard of thing that you would never imagine any fashion brand ever doing again, right? You just like kind of almost invented this model in a way? I, I'm not saying I invented the model, but, but there's Extremely no question. Yeah. But, you know, but don't keep in mind, I'm, I'm 27 years old. I'm super egomaniac. You know, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm flaunting it, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm pulling. I mean, at the time, I'm the first guy who has a, the, 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 the silver American Express car. Forget about the black one. It didn't even exist yet. Mm. I just go in. I go to Terry York here on uh, Ventura Boulevard, put it in. I say, here, I want that Rolls Royce. I'm paying 110. The price was $110,000 or 105000 I want to pay 105000 106000 I want it black on black. I want, I, I have 10 minutes. I mean, I was very cocky and very arrogant. And because I felt like I was entitled and I felt like, you know, I earned it. Nobody else did it. It's me. I mean, mm. you know, today as I got old, I mean, I feel like that the only reason why I'm successful is because, you know, whether you're religious or not, you know, it's, I believe in, in, in the blessings of the universe, of, of God, that, that, that you, you have a certain talent, but, you know, God or the universe directs you and, you, and you're channeling those talents through, through and but because realities. At the end of the day, even if you are incredibly talented, incredibly gifted beyond almost anybody else out there. Yeah. You still just got lucky, kinda. You know, like yeah, you, you, it, it, you, it's, it's, you didn't like, choose to be born this way. No, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't believe in, I mean, it, it, again, luck is, 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 is it, it's not the word. For me, it's, it's uh, the blessings. Mm. So uh, again, let me, as far as principles of, of, of way of life that I have is, is you know, for me, the keys to success are four different levels. Uh, you know, for me, there is, you have to work hard. The good thing about working hard is that nobody can take that away from you. Mm. I mean, you can be broke, but you can work hard. And, I, and myself, I work hard. Even when I went through, I went all the way up and I lost it all and made it all. And I, all through the years, I always work hard. I didn't care. 
I mean, even if I was cleaning my, 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 my office or, or filing papers or, or doing whatever I had to do. Number two is, and that you learn as, as you mature, is it's not about working hard. You have to also work smart. Right. You, know, you don't have to run and try to become uh, all the way on top. It's okay. If you can walk slowly and you know what you're doing and you be careful who's around you, who you trust, who you don't trust, you, you're going to make something. So that's, that's the two key sort of thing. Right. Number three uh, element is that you have to know is you have to, to really pinpoint where is your, what is your given, God-given talent. What is your talent? Are you a musician? Are you an interviewer? Are you a, a designer? I mean, you, you have to figure, oh, 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 you might be a, a, have a squeegee on, on, in the corner and cleaning up the, 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 the windshield, but you are the best one at what you do. And you're passionate about what you do and you make it perfectly. So discover what your talent is. And of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit, taking extremes. And those are the three elements. You have the three elements, you're going to be successful one way or the other. I, right. There's no way that you cannot be successful. You're not going to be a billionaire. You're going to be a millionaire. You're going to, but you're going to have plenty of food to live. You're going to have enough to su support your families and your friends and live a, a, a decent, comfortable life. But the difference between you and the squeegee guy is that the squeegee guy is really just performing a task. And like you were able to see something that the world wanted and needed before they had you know, but he's better communicated at that. windshield that I am. And he actually made seventy five million dollars, right. and I, I, then yeah. after you made that seventy five million, did they come in and say, "You know what? Uh, we're gonna cut you short"? Yeah. How long uh, were you able to maintain that? That was before that. They, they came before that. So, so what happened is, so the first year I would go in, and, and the error was, and you know, I, I don't speak about it, but I'm just telling you, I don't, I don't care, because the truth. Uh, now suddenly, George is by himself. And he brings his, his brothers with him. So he owns 60% of the company. His brothers own 40% of the company. So the brothers are getting challenged. They want to get more ownership. Bam, bam, bam. They make some kind of split, you know, where he owns only 40% and the brothers own 20%. So they're, like, they're already down to George only 40% only of the company. Now suddenly, they're hot, hot, hot. George comes into the picture and says, we want to buy the company from you. And at the time, they're doing, you know, like I said, two, three, four million dollars a year. And Jordan offered them to buy the company on the base of $10 million. They offered them $5 million. Mm. So George basically, out of 40%, gets like, you know, I don't know the time, maybe, I think he's still at 60%, so he, he owns like, he gets $3 million check, and each one of the brothers gets $600,000. You know, and they're very happy. I mean, mm. it's a big, but they don't realize that they suddenly quickly realize that's, it's a bad deal because the company now the second year, when I did when they did two million, uh, my, my first year I did two million. They were already at, at twenty five million. When I did uh, thirty million, uh, thirty million, twenty seven million the second year, they were at eighty million dollars. So they realized they made a bad deal with Jordan. So they start getting into lawsuit with them and all stuff. But at the same time, they realized that even when I made. Uh, uh, $27 million in 1984, my tax return was $6 million. Mm. My person, I'm talking like, this is real money today. $6 million a year is a right. lot of money. Imagine 1984. They're giving you a way bigger piece yeah. of the pie than any so fashion I'm, brand would ever expect to give a designer. I'm, I'm writing a check for me, like a, a, a pay, my payroll check as, as a CEO of my own personal company, which I own. I'm writing a check for $43,000 a week. <laughs> right. And... And we're only starting with computers, and we don't. The, there was not such thing as a payroll program to write that. The only payroll program we had was a payroll program that existed for the NFL players, and the maximum check you could write was nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety-nine, below twenty grand. So I would get three checks a, a week to do that, plus the bonuses I would get. My I need a hundred grand. Well, I get a hundred grand. I need to buy that building at two fifty. I buy two fifty. I write. I take from the company. I'm making money left and right. Six million dollars. Tax return, official money. I mean, no. At that point, there's no more Mickey Mouse or anything like that. Right. Because obviously, I'm under licensing agreement. I'm, I need to keep everything by the rules, and you know, because I'm getting audited. And I started seeing the. So, in essence, when I'm making twenty-seven million dollars, I'm making hundred percent of my pie. When they make eighty million dollars, let's say they make ten million dollar profit, their individual share. I'm making more money than any individual. Of any, so there's three partners on one side of the Jordache, and there's four partners on the on the side of Get. So there's seven partners, like dividing a pie. Where I'm by myself, like the 27 year old kid that's 
has all the beautiful girls and all the uh, the Rolls Royces and the Porsches and 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 I'm flashy and I'm like I'm I'm already some mingling with celebrities. And hey, you're with, you're only 27 at this point. Yeah. Oh my god. And, and I'm with the celebrities. You really managed I'm, to figure shit out in America pretty fast there. Yeah, I was totally fast. thinking you were way yeah, older. Very fast. Okay. Within, within I told you I moved 1980 by 19 and 1984 my tax return was was six and six million dollars and change. So. So they decide that they they, they, they they want to cut me off completely. Right. And uh, so from 1984, they never, obviously every design that I have to do, I mean, you guys are familiar, you have to get it approved by them. They would not approve anything anymore. Okay. So I was able to do $75 million in sales in 1985 with, just with my old designs that I made in 1983 and early 1984. Wow. And... Because uh, ultimately you, you built like respect in the, uh, in the fashion world doing guests. Uh, Not really. People didn't know who I was. No, still. People, people didn't know who Jeff Hamilton was. Well, because it wasn't like a high-end fashion thing at that time. It, right? Was it, it more was, working class? No, no. It was still... Was we, The only game in town at the time was Levi's, Wranglers, and so all those brands. Then, you, then the second generation became uh, Sergio Valente, uh, Jordache, uh, Sassoon Jeans, uh, Chardon, all kind of like odd... Brand, but made in China. But, they but still were cheap brands. My stuff, we came in, we invented the stonewash. But you're saying that the fashion world hadn't necessarily figured out that you were the one sort of pulling the strings no, on all you, this? No, the new guest was. And George Massino was getting correct, right. which I was, at the time, it, it was not that important for me to tell everybody I was a designer because I even considered myself a designer because I only designed out of necessity. <laughs> right. I learned... I learned how to be. I became an accountant by necessity. I became a, a production manager by, by when you need to do it, you do it. And and so I became a designer by necessity. At the beginning, I had somebody that wanted to help me, and, and I just could not do it. So I went to my closet and I said, I like this shirt. I like that pen. I like that thing. Let's put a, a zipper here. Let's put a cut here. Let's do a, a flap here. Whatever it was, and I kept on, on adding and and evolving and basically being inspired by other people and try to make it my own. Right. And and that's really where where I really start hitting the culture. Mm. Like suddenly, like the, the inner cities, like the Detroit and the Chicago, you know, I, I, people, I mean, I'm vibing with, with my design because that's the way I feel, you know? So I'm starting come, to come up with jackets, denim jackets with like, and I come up, I, I'm the first one who came up with the idea of mixing leather with the denim. And you guys are way too young probably to remember guests at that time, but maybe you were not even born probably. So probably, yeah. And, and and so I'm. And we're almost with, forty. But, but that was that was seventy nine years ago. So yeah, yeah. So um. And and I start vibing with that stuff. So so, so so they really decide to try to to cut me off in any way. They're blocking me from from me not to producing in, all kind of interference. But whatever it is, you know, let's not get into so, the you negativity. So so basically, I I have no choice just to go and. And file, start filing lawsuits against them. Now right. at that point, we're not even talking. We, you know, and you know, I mean, to be fair, uh, they approached me to 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 partner up with them and be fifty percent partners with them. And I just didn't. I say, well, if I'm again, my ego and my bad advice of lawyers. Uh, if if I'm good enough to be uh, your partner, how come I not be good enough to be uh, on my own? But keep in mind, I'm giving them when I do thirty million dollars second years. I'm giving them. Uh, uh, 2.1 million dollars of royalty for them to do nothing at all. Mm. I mean, it's like I'm doing all the work, I'm investing, it's my own money. I'm just writing them a check of royalties, you know. So, so they're really becoming very nasty. We're getting into a nasty battle. I'm talking about 1984. I'm spending 100, 200 grand a month in attorneys. And is wow. And is it just consuming your life? Like you it's can't really, my life you can't be creative. You can't do other be, stuff. I mean, no, no, I couldn't be creative because I could not design anymore. And it's not like you can start idea. your own brand, right? Because you're probably under some kind of. I, I, of course, it was in my mind to do it, but you know, it was not right now. At that point, was that so? Right. So basically, they tried to cut me off. I won. They could not. Uh, they could not stop. But basically, I had to finish my my contract, which was three and a half, four years. Uh, I finished my, my 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 contract, and then you know, just uh, the lawsuit. I already spent three million dollars. I could not afford. I mean, even though as much as money I made, I could not survive it. You know, because obviously not at that point I already bought a. I'm talking about 1983. I bought a two million dollar home in Beverly Hills, which was probably. 10 or 15 million dollars today. Uh, I bought a building downtown, which is like 150,000 square feet. I bought another building. I bought it like all kind of crazy stuff. I'm, I'm, and I'm living life also. I'm you know, traveling the world and 
and spending money like like it's there's no tomorrow. Right. So how did you, how do you get back into the groove, or how how did the lawsuit end? So so we we basically decide that you know, we each each, uh, each party was going to go their own way, and that was the end of it. But in a, but in in a way, I was a loser because I had spent so much money in my stuff, and and then they took over the company, and they just you know they already had like a shell of a men's company that was already doing a, a seventy five million dollars a year, so it was very easy for them to carry on, which they never. I don't even know if they did that much at the time. For the next 10 years, they never even got closer to me because they really tried to adjust. They didn't understand that. I thought fashion at the time, I had become a designer by necessity, but I really felt the vibe of what the market needed. And, and then that's the key also to be a good designer. It's not only about being super talented and having something crazy. You have to be relatable to as many people as you can. You know, if you can make a T-shirt that's, that's, that's pink, you make it out there. It's not, not only because you like it, for sure. You have to love what you do. But also you have to feel that you're going to reach as many people as you can. They're going to, same this, they're going to have the same vision of the time at that moment in time. You could make a beautiful design and, and then you, you don't, you're not relevant to, 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 to the time. Or you can make an amazing song, an amazing beats, an amazing uh, uh, music, but it's not what the market needs at that time. Right. You are there. I mean, you know, take the Vincent Van Gogh uh, uh, syndrome. You know, the guy is the biggest artist I ever made paintings that sell for five hundred, six hundred million dollars. The guy in his lifetime never sold one painting because of timing or because of not knowing how to, you have to know how to market, you have to do everything together. Right. So let, let me regress. So, so at that time, once we finish, I said, I have to go do something. And keep in mind, I have a huge overhead at that point. I have a 50,000 square feet warehouse. I have like a, you know, one point in time, I had 200 employees there. I mean, I start firing everybody because I could not keep the overhead. And I said, I'm, what's a natural thing to do? Because all my stores knew the company under Jeff Hamilton Inc. DBA Guess for Men. So even though my business card didn't have my my real name is Jeff Bobot. That's mm -hmm. my legal name. And uh, so I said, you know, why not trademark the name Jeff Hamilton? Because people already can relate that to to Guess, and they know me. And so I, and I decided to basically do a lifestyle brand with jeans and shirts and. And I started spending a lot of money in advertising. I'm talking like a hundred grand a month in advertising. Really? I had billboards on Times Square in 1986 and, and GQ and, and Esquire and Interview Magazine and all the magazines tried to publicity. So the name is out there, but, but again, I mean, I, I don't have a structure also to, to create the whole line from scratch, even though I had it. I mean, I'm starting to run out of funds and cash flows and, so at the time I was like used to run around with like J James Caan and and Billy Idol, which was like the biggest thing at the time. Right. And I started riding Hollies, and my hair was up to my shoulder. And I just wanted to create certain things for me. I had the money, but I really I would go on Radio Drive, and I could never find like a really cool jacket that I wanted to wear. So I started making my own, which I didn't know how to make it, but I made one at a time because it was I didn't care how long it would take me, but we made it. Start creating new techniques of cutting leather with scissors, forget about knives, and stitching them together and putting it together, and everybody went crazy with that. So, so why do you, why do you so, feel like black people more so identify with your with, with your ideas and your creations as far as the style? And is it seeing? Uh, does it take a European's view of the culture to really be able to create something new? It's kind of I, I wonder. I think it's if a that, little bit much much more organic than that. It's it's not. It's not a calculated process. It's not a calculated process. It's just, it's me. It's me. I mean, I, again, I mean, again, not not an ego thing. It's just the way I vibe, the way I feel, the way I'm, I'm comfortable with. Obviously, I mean, there is, with, with, with the black culture, uh, there is that 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 lack of inhibition. I mean, you, you wear something, you feel good, you wear it. You, you can be flashy because you're very comfortable in your skin. And that's the way it is. You know, I mean, I'm, and myself, I've always been like very flashy. I mean, I look at me. I mean, I'm 67 years old and <laughs> I'm wearing like all crazy. I mean, and I, I toned down today because I'm going out to dinner. So I said, I'm going to wear black. But I had a big, bright, a python red jacket this morning. Um, so 
and and I felt like really for me it was a, an audience that really related to me and but really not calculated. It's not like here I'm going to design something because I want black people to buy for me or I want to design something because I want Latin people. It, it is what I I design something. I only design for me first. If I, I love something that I vibe with and then I put it out and uh, and it, it organically it built like that and obviously. Uh, you know, as I made the jackets and I started making them, people want to buy it. I said, I don't know how to make those jackets. So I started raising prices because I didn't know how to produce it. Mm. And uh, some stores say, we don't care. We just, we're not going to sell those jackets because they're too expensive. However, we're going to put them in a window. They're going to be such a conversation piece that people are going to walk in the store and buy other things. Lo and behold, people start buying those jackets, you know? Mm. And people said, like, if we don't sell it, I'm still going to wear it, the owners, because they still loved it. And they start, start selling it. So one thing led to the other. And so one thing, so we, I get to make Michael Jackson, to make some jackets for him, we made jackets for Madonna. I mean, we're talking about like, 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 like mid to late 80s. Did you ever get to meet Michael Jackson? Oh, many times, yeah. Many wow. times. yeah and pull well, up you know, on him and give him a jacket. Like yeah, 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 Michael. of course. Yeah, and Just and, like and, and um, <laughs> even better than that, you know, I, I had made enough money that I bought a house in Beverly Hills, um, uh, on the hills, and, uh, and uh, just didn't want to didn't want to live because it was too expensive for me to live in the house yet. So I rented it to uh, Jermaine Jackson. So I, I rented Jermaine. Jermaine became friends. I became friends with Jermaine. I became friends with Jackie. And then I, every time there was a family function, I was invited with them. So I so I got to meet him. Uh, uh, but uh, I met, met Madonna. Same thing. And then I got George Michael to to to, to start wearing my jackets. Now suddenly everybody's going crazy. I mean, I get to, from that get, gets to Andrew Dice Clay. Uh, we get uh, even before I even start really getting heavy into the the the, the, the jackets more uh, as a production stuff. I mean, I you know I'm one of the basketball players, Reggie Theus. You know, just uh, you know knew his, his his girlfriend, and he said, you know, he wants me to you to make him. A, he was moving from Kansas City Royals to Sacramento Kings at the time when they moved the team. So he wants to make you a, an NBA jacket. So the NBA car players came to me. Then he introduced me to Magic, and I became friends. I'm talking about 1986 now, and Magic introduced me to Michael, and so I started making jackets to Michael in 1986. And, uh, and, and then at that point, 1988, 89, uh, I had a friend of mine, and I was wearing, making, wearing all those crazy jackets. He said, how, how crazy would it be if you could make a, could you make me a Giants, New York Giants jacket? Because I'm friends with the owner, like uh, Steve Tisch from, from, from the Giants. I want to give it to him as a present. Hold on. So why are we, why are you, let's go back to these stories. So <laughs> <laughs> you making jackets from Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, like, where are these are these initial conversations taking place? Are you because they was partying heavy and crazy? Like, were you at those parties or in no. in those houses or anything like no, that? I, 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 no, I, I was not in the, the, in those bits, uh, in those pool parties and stuff like that. No, I, I, I ultimately I end up going to a lot of parties, but like more toned down parties with Arsenio and and stuff like that. So I, you know, I was very I used to be very close with Arsenio also, and later on, like in the, in the nineties, you know. Like the jackets, the jackets got you that initial conversations to be like and build those relationships. You know what I'm saying? Jackets have opened the door to me to everywhere. I mean, I'm talking to the White House, to uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, to to. I've met all those people just because of jackets. Uh, You know, big and smalls, everybody. So, but but you were just focused on business. You didn't get lost in the sauce of the drugs and the women and everything like that. I'm not gonna say. <laughs> no, at, at, that, at that point, I mean, at that point, I, 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 I met somebody and uh, broke up with my first wife and and uh, just you know and I, that and, and I was with this girl and uh, and I've been with this girl for 38 years. So. Oh well, congrats. But okay, compare running guest men's and selling you know i don't know thousands or millions of pairs of the same jeans or the same designs compare that to doing these one-off pieces for big celebrities and stuff it feels like that's almost the polar opposite of what you could be doing fashion wise like making individual sick custom yeah. pieces versus mass the, the market money was not there to be honest i mean the money mm. was not there I right mean, i was i was Barely making my overhead, could not even make my overhead. But there's a lot of prestige associated there with it too. There's a lot of prestige, I mean, and I build up, and you know, kind of like fast forward to 2022. I mean, those are like 
the roots of that build, they were so strong and so solid that obviously that's how I've been able to keep up my name and be consistent through the 35, 37 years of, of doing the same thing and, and keeping very true to, to my integrity of design to do it. So for me, it isn't as of today. I mean, somebody comes in and wants a one of one jacket I'll make, and obviously the prices are, are crazy. I mean, I make jacket with 10, 15 grand right now, one Ooh. of one, but, Damn, but, Heather? but I make it. But I make it, you know, it's not like, you know. You better appreciate her. Yeah. <laughs> So, and you know, it was not 15 grand. Don't oh, you <laughs> took it easy on that. Don't, wow. don't, 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 go in, don't go through the American Express card and do that. Yeah, you know? yeah. don't, I don't want to give any secrets or anything like that, you know, in case you pay for it. Or card. I want to make sure she that she spent my money to get the jacket for me on my birthday. Yeah. yeah. No, so, but, uh, so, uh, so I, I started basically getting involved with, uh, so I did that and that uh, Giants jacket, and the NFL reached out to me and said, you know, we saw the jacket. It's fucking awesome. I can't curse on it. Yeah. No, 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 of course. So it, 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 it's awesome. And it's just like, uh, and I, at the time, the jacket, if you see it today, it's like an ugly jacket. It's like, it's not like the lambskin stuff. It was like pig skin, like right. very thin, like look like fake leather, you know? But if I were you, I would have been thinking the opposite of like, maybe they're going to come down on me for copyright infringement at some point. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I was authorized by the NFL when I did it. Oh, even oh, when no. you started. Okay. No, even when I started. But then oh, no, wow. the, 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 somebody from the NFL, a licensee asked me to do that. And he, before showing it to giving it to, uh, to the owner of the Giants, went to the NFL and said, he's my buddy who did that jacket. Look at that jacket. At that time, they sold only Kmart, Walmart, or whatever, Target. Right. There was no licensing business was not a prestigious stuff. Though, so they came to me and said, we want to give you a license to make jackets. I said, really, I, 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 in my mind, I said, nobody's gonna, actually going to buy a jacket for $1,000 retail. At the time, it was $1,000 retail in 1988, 1989. However, pretty cool. I mean, you, you're dealing with about 14, 1,500 players. You know, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 are black, you know. They, 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 they get the... the, the this, they get the styling, you know, the, the athletes, they have a lot of income. Uh, so let's assume if I sell 200, I mean, there, there's a lot of owners, I have a lot of money, there's a lot of sponsors that have a lot of money. Let's assume I sell 200 jackets a year. You know, that's, that's 500 bucks, that's 100 grand. So even, I'm not going to make money, I'm not going to lose money, but on my letterhead, that's pretty cool to say that I'm associated with the NFL. Right. And, and the way that people would think of it now is like you build other stuff, other parts. You sell T-shirts, you sell trucker hats, yeah. or whatever the fuck yeah, associated with it. Yeah, but myself was like focused only on jackets. Okay. I, I didn't get licenses to. I didn't want to do T-shirts. I didn't want to do shirts. I didn't want to do jeans. I want. I want to do jackets. That's all I want to do. I did a couple of hats also, and leather. I, I was the first one to do the leather hats in in the eighties. You know, so uh, so I started doing that. Like, obviously, I started showing the the, the jack. Everybody started loving it. Uh, when I do the, the trade show, the magic shows and stuff like that, uh, the NBA come to me and said, you know, we wanted, what deal did you have in the NFL? So they just gave it to me. No money up front, paying 10% royalty, and I do it. And obviously at the time, everybody, we saw only, in the NFL, we sold only uh, uh, one team. It was only Raiders. 90% of the business was Raiders. Okay. The rest, the Cowboys, a little bit here and there. But, you know, you're talking about like NWA, all, all, all the, 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 the get a rap and all the stuff that they wanted all the black. So we sold only that. We sold Chicago Bulls. Forget about Lakers. And we sold in baseball I sold White Sox. Yeah, and in hockey the I sold the <laughs> and, and the Los Angeles King. All the black and white colors and Chicago Bulls. And I started getting licensed and I started making that and I started getting building it. You know people say, well we cannot afford a thousand dollars. We need to come up with different versions. So I came up with a younger, uh, less um, Pricey jacket was two hundred, two hundred fifty dollars retail. And what year did that come out? Um, nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety. Okay. And that I start long flooding the market with that. So then and then those are in the malls and everything. Uh, those are in the malls. In the mall, we had like a thousand stores. You know, like we're buying it across, and and never be, became as big as 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 gas. But we was doing twenty, more than twenty, twenty five million dollars in sales. Right. How so, did it make you feel like we're having so many iconic moments like in the culture, like Michael Jordan, you know what I'm saying, wearing your jacket, and especially Kobe, like that <clears throat> iconic picture with Kobe, like 
Like, how did that start making you feel, like, you know, as a designer? At, at the time, I didn't look at it like that. I mean, I, you know, today, in, in retrospect today, I mean, I'm just, like, looking at it. I say, wow, I, I just cannot believe. <coughs> I mean, when I start talk, talking about the things that I've done and where I have been, it's just so amazing. I mean, like, like that I've been so lucky to be in the locker room with Kobe or, or shaking hands with Nelson Mandela or, or being with, uh, with uh, uh, President Clinton and having dinner with him, you know, I mean, things like that just because I make jackets. Uh, but I never really calculated that. You know, the only thing I can tell you is the first celebrity I ever met in my life, and I think it was Ken Norton, the, the, the boxer, and, and of course, ultimately I ended up becoming best friend with, with Muhammad Ali, and, and, and obviously I, I'm still friends with, with Mike Tyson, and, one of my favorite human beings on human being on earth, uh, but from the first celebrity I met, I still felt like the little kid that was ten years old in France that 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 my legs were trembling and and today when I met a celebrity, I I have the same feeling. I'm still very humble when I meet somebody because it's like not necessarily a celebrity, but as somebody that but a celebrity is very easily uh, you can 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 identify because it's just somebody that has been able, able to elevate themselves because of their talent that they have, one way or the other. And they certainly have an aura. And when you, you get into that aura, you feel like very humble to it. So I mean, even though it's a jacket, we hold your name to like such a high regard because of the people, you know what I'm saying, that's, that's wearing it and the respect they gave you too, you know, like even you bringing up Muhammad Ali, like, damn, can you like tell us a story about, you know, you know, being with Muhammad Ali, you know, and giving him a jacket. You imagine, you know, like, like again, you, you always have to see where you, where I got started. And, you know, like, and in, in, in 10 years old, and you know Muhammad Ali, the biggest name in the world, you know, that, you know, people didn't know about Michael Jordan or anything like that at the time. So, I mean, at the time, they already, when I met him. So one time I met a friend of mine who actually was a bodyguard from, uh, from Michael Jackson, which I had met, you know, he was taking me to all the, all, every time was Michael Jordan, Jackson show. I was I would be in the, in, in on basically on stage backstage the whole time for like six days in a row. I remember going sports arena. It was like I designed the outfit for the victory tour, you know, for all the Jacksons. So so he introduced me to Sugar Ray and he introduced me to Muhammad Ali. So uh, the first time I met Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali was at his uh, his birthday. You know, I don't know if you remember. You guys are way too young, but they had a restaurant called Chasen's. On, on Beverly Boulevard, which was like the hottest restaurant in, in Los Angeles. Like, I'm talking about old school, uh, Frank Sinatra, Ronald Reagan, all those big old uh, stars and movie stars had been there for like 30, 40 years. And that's where they had the birthday. And I met him and kind of like, you know, after that, you know, every time there was an opportunity to be around him, I, I did. And then he wanted me to do uh, some jacket for all his family, for all his kids. So we did that. Then I licensed out his name to do some jackets. And I made the limited edition 100 jackets of, of his. And so he would, he would come to my office and he would just sign autograph to all my employees and he'd do his, uh, his uh, magic tricks and to all the people. And he was like a wonderful in, beautiful person. In, in terms of what you're building, is it ever shocking to you just that your stuff seems to stand the test of time, given that in fashion, a lot of stuff that was cool two years ago is laughable now? Like, like, do you dwell on that much or think yeah, about how to maintain so, the relevance? So. And, and, and again, it, it evolved organically to that point. But um, the way I look at it is, is you know, once I, start, I put my name on the label, I said, there's no way I can go and do shortcuts. I, I'm not gonna break the integrity of, of my brand to make a buck. You know, I mean, mm. it, that is, you know, as I evolve much more and more and more, I, I, I live by that, by those uh, principles that, and then there was a lot of knockoff, a lot of people trying to do JH and not Jeff Hamilton and different things like that, you know? And so I really tried to kind of elevate myself where, where I really don't consider myself like necessarily just a designer. Myself, I really, again, I feel, my, I feel myself more as an artist, you know? So, so and, I, and I kind of realized that point, you know, where when people came to me and they say, well, oh my, my God, Jeff Hamilton, you know, I own three of your pieces. Why don't you say I own three of your jackets, you know? So, and you only refer to pieces when it's referred to art. Right. So I kind of like say, how can I elevate my brand 
into making it more that it's so personal, there's a connection. So in 1991, I started signing every single jacket I make. Not only the jacket, all the high end. As of now, I sign every single jacket I make. I don't care if it's a $300 jacket. Or, there's not a $300 jacket for charity. My cheapest one is $850. But every jacket that I do, I sign every single jacket. Right. Every jacket is packaged in a certain way. Uh, on the high-end jackets, like the, the, the $5,000, $10,000, I actually create a piece of art, which I print, and then I all hand in hands, and I sign it, and I, and I put a seal. So whenever you get the, 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 the Jeff Allen jacket, you really get an experience. But also a very, very important so. Like, even in 2000, I used to ship the jacket with my signature, but it was not actually hand-signed. It was embroidered with my signature, where now I physically do it. So the idea is I want... I mean, we're talking about also an era that there was no social media, there was no Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or anything like that. Right. Uh, it was only from the buzz that goes out in the street. You know, obviously the word the, of mouth. The, the word of mouth, and you get like when you see when Cameron uh, shoots me out in one of his songs. I mean, you know, <laughs> everybody knows what it is, and it's a big, it's bigger than than God at that time in 2000. Did right. you know they had Jeff Hamilton jackets on them? Dipset. I guess it probably wasn't cognizant of who designed oh, them I mean, at if, that time. If you look at it, I mean, if, when he Cole. mentioned my name in that Get Em Girls, I mean, and, and, and I, Talk only three, it. four years ago, I watched a video on YouTube, and, and what did I see on the video? Virgil is in the video, Dance in the video, uh, Kanye is in the video. I mean, all those people are in the video like that, and then they were not, nobody knew who Kanye was at the time. Right. In 2000, nobody knew who Kanye was. And he was only like a, a great producer, made amazing beats, and people was, was but that they grew up together from, you know, I gotta ask from this Chicago, question. And, but they were, they, were, they were coming to Harlem to try to get the, the vibe. I gotta ask this question, and of course, God forbid, but do you spend time thinking about what becomes of the brand once you're yeah. gone? Yeah, so I'll, I'll get to that, you know, like, like, because I really want to tell you where, where I'm at. But, but so, and I, I'll get to that right now. So for me, like today, again, giving you always my, my uh, and I don't mean by be my precepts of how I run my business and my life is I have three major, uh, three major things that make me happy today, mm. where, I, where I work for, which is something that when you're young, I never felt I would get those rewards. I felt like the only reward when I work is money. Right. And unfortunately, when you're an entrepreneur, all you care is about money, and which is, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, you, we need money. We need to have money. I need to have money to pay my bills. I need to have money to support my family. But beyond that, if I don't have a Louis Vuitton pair of shoes or a Prada or whatever it is, it's, it's okay. You know, you, you still can be okay. You know, it, you're still going to survive. So at this stage of my life, money is very important, and I work for money, and, but it's, it's not my, only my priority. I'm going to say not only because it is a priority. The number two priority is to finally discover, because I went through many ups and downs, and I only came back to work two years ago. Mm. And, and it just caught on fire like, like crazy. What were you doing during that hiatus, Nothing. and how long was it? I was retired, and I was doing art, and I, and I got involved in different ventures. Not successful. Really? And really just like realized that, you know, cannot afford anymore like $38,000 a month of mortgage on, on my house, you know. Yeah, I'm bleeding every night, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm, and I'm, but at that point, I'm already into weed and alcohol and all that stuff so, to try to, to, to appease my pain, you know. I'm, you know I'm, I went through a nasty divorce from my first wife that lasted 19 years, spent $7 Jeez. million dollars in attorneys, you know. But, so the money is like, you know, and, and you think, you still think you're there and keep on living the lifestyle. So the whole thing is, you know, still driving the Bentley, still driving the, 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 mm. the, all my cars and still having the watches and the lifestyle and people still think I'm like a big shot, but I'm not. And uh, so, so at that point, you know, so the realization that came when I came back was I'm so blessed to know that I can get to work every morning and I get to do something that I love. Like, like when I told you the, the blessing of the universe gives you. That. And, and when I said that's the reason why, luck is something. So, so when I was telling you earlier, like the three things, work hard, work smart, and find you, 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 your vocation of what it is, the fourth element that really puts the whole thing together and, and, and envelops and puts the sunshine and the aura is what you said, luck, which I call blessings. It's like the element. Luck is not luck. It's going to come in. Blessings are going to come and go. But basically, the universe can... And I don't want to sound like I'm religious. 
which I am to a certain extent, but I believe in the, the rules of the universe. You know, I, and I believe that the universe can come and take everything from you and can give it to you back. In, and and I'm, I'm a living example of what has happened. And because of my, my, my consist, constant work always has been there doing all that stuff. So, uh, so the second thing, like I was telling you, is, is uh, money is like priority number one, or equally. Uh, number two is, is uh, and I'm talking, I'm getting to the point of, of, of posterity. Uh, identifying what you love to do as a living, going to in the morning, waking up and knowing that I'm excited to do, knowing that I'm gonna design, whether I'm gonna do accounting, whether I'm gonna be work, do something that I'm gonna make a difference out there. Uh, and then number three thing is, uh, is legacy, mm. you know? So, and, and it's a new element that came into my life only two, three years ago. And I realized that suddenly people know who I am. You know, thanks for Instagram, of course. Yeah, you got five million followers. Yeah, and, and, but, but it's like, but again, when I was not working, I had 1.4 million. Mm. You know, understand why? Why? I, I had not posted one picture uh, of new content in, in years. It was all old, old pictures, like all history stuff. I was verified in 2014. Mm. Didn't ask anybody to be verified. And suddenly, like the whole thing started building in. You know, when, when I had to come back, you know, ASAP helped me a lot. Uh, Rocky, uh, I went to Yams Day, uh, you know, I was with them, you know, just with, with the, the whole ASAP mob and, and Virgil, you know, Virgil kind of referred to me as his mentor, you know, even though I you know, was not that close to him, you know, Don C mentioned that, old, you know, gave me a trophy telling me I was his mentor. And, and obviously they grew up in, 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 in the 90s in, in Chicago where the biggest thing that was there was the Bulls and she and and, and Michael Jordan wearing nothing but my jackets, right. and the most icon, my most iconic jacket that made my life. So, I realized that legacy played a big part. Like when I'm not here, my name, I want my name to stay around. I mean, I want my name. I don't have any plans per se as far as who's going to carry over the company and who's going to be there or whatever. I really, I have kind of some plan, but not everything very clear, you know, because I, you know, who knows if I'm not going to sell the company before, before I go away and, and retire, you know, or continue running it, but not having to, to want it. And because if, 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 if you're an entrepreneur, even me, I'm 38. I mean, it has to at least cross your mind at times, you know, if I get fucking hit by a car tomorrow, what happens? I, I do it. Of course I do it. Of course, you know, so, um, no, I have, I have, I have a certain, uh, uh, things in place, you know, mm. just to in case uh, something uh, something happens. Definitely. Um, it's interesting when you say that you like tried other things and then came back to the root because I feel like a lot of us are kind of constantly facing those questions in life. Like, there's, I I could sit here and do interviews every day, and I know that they're gonna make some money and there is gonna be an audience for it. Some, but sometimes once you've done a million interviews or you've made a million jackets, you start to think, maybe I could do something bigger. Maybe I could do something different. It, it was a little bit different, you know. Just uh, in 2002, I sold my company to, to a public company, and I sold for a lot of money, and, uh, and I started making a lot of money. That was making a lot of money just working for them. Mm. I was making $3 million a year as a salary, whatever, between the salary, the bonus, and the free. I mean, something like 2002. And, and then I sold it on top of it, and then they decided not to pay me, they started to cut down everything. And I was making too much money. And I was too much of a, you know, too much of a shiny star mm. into a corporate world that they tried to push me out. And they basically pushed me out. And again, lawyers and lawyers. So, so technically from 1984 till 2007, I was with nothing but lawyers. I'm talking tens wow. of probably 20, 30 million dollars in lawyers my whole lifetime I spent. And, and I was burned out. Mm. So the divorce took over everything my, with my wife. Even though I won the divorce, I spent seven million dollars in attorneys, uh, broke my relationship with all my, my kids, wow. uh, and and I was miserable. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. Honestly, I didn't want to be around. And it's just, uh, you know, like I said, I'm maybe the spiritual person in me didn't allow me just to cross the line any time after that. And and I was totally burnt out again. And then to the point where in 2019. Uh, just didn't want to do anything anymore. Didn't want to wake up in the morning. I was like, like I say, wake up in the morning and drinking and take two Xanax and 
smoke weed and not want to go, not want to work, even though that was against my precept of me, my, 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 my discipline. And uh, getting into fender benders every day, sold my cars because I just couldn't afford it anymore. Uh, sold the house. Uh, and uh, I started getting, like I say, fender benders till I got into a really bad car accident which happened to be not my fault, maybe. It was not my fault, but for some reason, you know, I just, if I had better reflexes at the time, I would have been better. I was not uh, under, it was in the morning. Right. And I was five days in the hospital. I fractured my chest, broke my arm, mm. and I was like. Who was there to take care of you through all this stuff you was going through? It's just my wife and my mother. You know, at that time, I separated with my wife. Uh, um, even though we're still together, we're not, you know, my wife had been with her 38 years together, so she's always going to be around with me, and, and I still, she's still number one in my life, and, and my mom, you know, and, and so I started taking care of my mom, and my mom is 89 years old, but so it's kind of like, they were taking care of me. Uh, and at that point, you know, I just like really just didn't know what to do. I couldn't, I couldn't even get up from bed after, after the hospital. I mean, I was in t tremendous pain, could not sleep, broken wrist, all the thing, broken elbow. Uh, and pills and pills and all kind of like uh, eye opioids and just like was not even myself. I didn't want to even dress up and look at myself in the mirror. That was December 2019. Um, December, November, December, uh, Jim Jones and Vado decide to, they call me, they say, we're going to do a song called Jeff Hamilton. Wow. And why? <laughs> like really in my <laughs> mind, like I don't get it. I mean, LL Cool J 10 years before said, so you know, you've heard, you're a big part of the culture. And I said, well, is he smoking? Is he, the, what, what does he mean? I don't, I've never done anything intentionally to be part of anything. I just did it from my heart with my feelings, my trying to be as creative as I could be. And uh, so they came up with that song and, you know, I didn't have any jackets actually. I wasn't even working. So I had only my personal jacket. I loaned them all my personal jacket. They wore them in the videos and stuff like that. And they want me to, to fly to New York to be in the video. And I say, well, if I go to New York, it'll cost me another couple of grand. And I, I don't have two grand to, 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 to waste in to, to, to going there for, so I, I, didn't, I didn't do it. Uh, as a follow-up of that, I get a call from ASAP. I'm mean, gonna look at my Instagram and I get a DM and I get 600 DMs a day, but I answer all of them. As of today, I still do. Whether it's an emoji, a little emoji or a little heart or a little comment and, so I, I see this guy, I said, you know, I, I'm a big fan of yours. I grew up with you in Harlem and, you know, um, I love what you've done with the athletes and, and the, the deep set and this and that. And I said, thank you, my friend. I didn't even look who, who he was, you know, I mean, I don't look. And uh, he said, well, if you're in Beverly Hills, I'd love to have lunch with you. If you ever come to Beverly Hills, I'd love to have lunch. So I, I actually live in, in Los Angeles, I live in Beverly Hills. You know, and if you want to do tomorrow, I can do it. I mean, I'm, I'm not working anyway, so at that time. And I said, sure, tomorrow works. And, uh, and then I said, who, who wants to invite me to lunch? I mean, so the guy's, the guy's a fan, and they look at it, of course. I mean, like, ASAP Rocky. Honestly, I didn't know who ASAP Rocky was. I mean, I knew ASAP Rocky. I, isn't as of today. I mean, I know about ASAP Mob and all this stuff, but ASAP Jans. But I don't know, I'm friends with Ferg, but, but I don't know even the music. Right. And, uh, but I knew the name because obviously being him in jail in Sweden and being out of jail right. and that stuff. So I knew it because of the news. So he was super great with me. I mean, Tommy was friends with Virgil and, and, and Don C and they talked about me. He, at the time he even like talked to me and said, we need to re re resurrect your brand. You have, you, you know what you mean to the culture, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I said, I mean, where does that come from? I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm part of the culture. I mean, how, I mean, how, how so? I mean, I've, I've always done something that I love and I've made a living out of it. I never did anything intentionally to try to, to create a hype around it. I mean, it, there was never anything conscious about that. It isn't enough today. There's nothing conscious about it. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit more selective when I do a collaboration. And, and it seems like you haven't fully embraced it as far as being in a oh, culture completely. because yes you are like in the history book like you stamp there's nothing you can do about it like you can't go nowhere like you but, can't even say i don't want to do it but like, to, today, today I'm, I'm 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 loving it because i'm 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 able to in, in the, after two years and coming back bigger than i ever was i'm not saying i'm doing 75 million dollars a year in sales but i'm 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 up there doing really well again with the three elements building my legacy, building, uh, uh, doing something I love and, and, and making enough money to, 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 to be comfortable. Mm. Uh, 
But you know, there's something new that just happened. You know, you walk into, uh, I can walk through the airport, I can walk in the streets, I mean, I can go through the streets of New York and say, oh my God, you're Jeff Hamilton, you know, can I take a picture with you? I, mean, I was at a Ralph Lauren restaurant in, in New York, people saw me, oh my, oh my, I'm such a big fan, I mean, a big fan. How so? I mean, make jackets. I mean, I'm not like a, I'm not a celebrity. I'm not anything like, I never looked at me as a, a celebrity and I never, and myself, I'm like, it's not the ego side of me that, that you know, for sure the ego side must love that, but how blessed I am that somebody gives me love. So I want to give them the love back. If they feel like I'm giving the love back by taking a picture, it's, it's, it's very rewarding to me. Well, you know, part of what's interesting about it is like in the eighties, if you saw an iconic photo of, of Michael Jack, uh, Michael Jordan wearing a, a, a crazy leather jacket, you think it's dope, but it's not like you can just hop on Google and figure out what it is. Whereas these days, it's easier for people to be more intense with their fandom. So it's like, it's just easier for people to figure out like, oh, this dude is the fucking dude who designed all these crazy jackets. It's easier but for them to get all, into all it. All that still was an evolution, you know? So, mm. so Instagram, obviously made aware of it, you know, like like the songs and people are mentioning song, whether it's Benny the Butcher and putting me in his videos and stuff like that. And and I naturally build up relationship with all the hip hop world, the, the, the sports world, uh, the art world. And uh, so I go to, so, so Iraqi says, you know, I want, to, I want you to come make me a custom jacket. For like 10 days, I said, there's no way. At that time, I don't have manufacturing capability. I said, there's no way I can do a jacket, a custom jacket. We're going to, we did a Lamborghini ja 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 jacket, you know, with that, how all the S up and the picture of Yams with the, the Kuji sweater and the whole thing. And I said, but if you want to, you have a concert. I didn't even know there was S is Yam Yams. S uh, 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 was Yams Day. I thought he was doing a big benefit for Juice World because he had just passed away in January of. Uh, uh, 2020. So, but he said, uh, I, I definitely want to wear a jacket for the concert. So I said, well, I have my personal jacket that I wore, that I wore when Kobe was holding the trophy, but the one I was wearing, uh, if you want, I can loan it to you. He said, great, I, I, I would love that. So I said, okay, give me an address, I'll ship it. He said, no, 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 I want you to come. I don't want to go spend the money again to, to another few thousand dollars to go to. I really, I'm not making money. I'm, I'm, I don't want to. And I didn't ask, I didn't say nothing. I said, but so I'm going to call my assistant. Uh, my assistant is going to call you. That's her name, Bam Bam. She's going to sell you a first class ticket and uh, a hotel and car service for all the time for you to come in. Come for three days. I want you to come to the concert. Mm. So I went to the concert. He wore the jacket. You know, uh, obviously I had made already a jacket for Rihanna. Rihanna was there. That's where he started going out with her. Uh -huh. uh, Drake was there. I didn't see him then, even though I had made jacket for him and I had not met him then. Uh, Everybody was there, like a little yachty and uh, and two chains, and uh, everybody was there, and and everybody gave me nothing but love. I say, Jim John, I was I, I was in backstage the whole time. I was on stage, you know, like ASAP always giving me love, and and the next day Virgil posts on his page uh, the 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 the, the, the ASAP with my jackets, and and uh, you know, I don't know if you kind of like dumbing it down, or, but. You, does it sound like you really haven't really and fully embraced it and you don't know what you really mean to us I, 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 in I hip hop and this world? Like, you, you, like, you are like, no, like, no, when you I need don't. to get in touch with it, you should be like, no, you know what? I, These I, people I really love me. It, it's more than a jacket, it's just the, it's feeling, it's the, it's like music, it's the way it makes us feel. Like you say, it's like it just gives us that certain feeling, and, and you know, and I, a certain I, I stature. Still have a different, a different, you know, I have a difficult time to grasp it. Again, still, why? Listen, I'm, it's not like I, I, I do uh, brain surgery. I'm, I'm making jackets. I mean, I make stuff that I love to do, but but I, I, I touching a sensitive chord in, into a big group, big, into a big audience. So it's like when you make a music and, and, and a certain music and it, like you said, but I really I'm still puzzled how me as a person, I'm, I'm, people are starting to like me before that, you know? So, so let me, the evolution so goes out, so I have tremendous success, big buzz. I mean, you know, Instagram start keep on building and building. And unfortunately, January 26, Kobe dies. Now suddenly the whole world now knows Kobe for being one of the greatest players ever, but also he's known for his jackets. 
in the locker room all those years, and especially that iconic picture with all the trophies. So now people start putting it together. Now, now they, that's the moment you start putting together. They start rocking the wearing the jacket, the Jeff Hamilton jacket. Mm. Now, now that now my Instagram blows up. Really? Everybody wow. wants to buy the jacket. I don't have the NBA license at that point. So I don't know how to produce. So that jacket is five grand. You want to buy the jacket? I was going to sell my own personal ones originally. I said, let me just sell. I have like seven, eight, ten jackets. I'll sell. That's money. And and so, so I called the NBA and I said, you know what? I'm getting overwhelmed with people buying jackets. I mean, I'm, I'm taking like selling five, ten jackets a week at the time. And I don't know how to produce them. So, I mean, I found right away the factories and the people to do it. So I, so I called uh, the NBA. I said, you know, I'm doing those jackets. Uh, I just don't want to do anything illegal. So I said, just go ahead and do it. You know, it's okay. You know, you're a friend for 30 years. So, so I do it, uh, and everything takes off. Then two weeks later, the week later, uh, the week after after the, the Kobe dies, it's a Super Bowl. So Saquon Barkley calls me and said, you know, three stylists, I want to wear a Kobe jacket. Can I loan, can I borrow a jacket from you? So he wears and gets tremendous publicity of him. In a press conference, where I'm wearing the Kobe jacket and this and that. That was in like the actual locker room, bam, bam publicity. Uh, the week after that, now I'm taking, I'm trying to get the upper hand. So I, I basically reach out to everybody. I reach out to Dave East. I reach out to to Jim Jones, to Vado, to to uh, who else was it? Like, uh, I mean, I, Chance the Rapper. I mean, all the, all those people. My tan jacket that I have in my warehouse, in my, my, my warehouse, in my bedroom, <laughs> that time I don't have a warehouse, I say, I want to loan them to you. You guys wear it and as a loaner, and you give it back to me. So they all wear it. So now everybody's sitting on the court at, at the Chicago All-Star Game, which I didn't go, but everybody knew my, my, my stuff. And uh, of course, like from then, everybody started contacting me, like big company, like Chinatown Market, Converse, we want to do a shoe with you, we want to do this with you, we want to do a collaboration with you. And, I, and like suddenly the bus started building up, and I'm working. Hit, then COVID hits, mm. big time. You know, I mean, there's like five cases, and then suddenly everything's are building up from that. At the same time, there is a Netflix documentary of, uh, of, uh, uh, the Last Dance, Michael Jordan, right. and that suddenly, like my jackets, also. I mean, I'm in the video. I mean, the, the the thing, like with me and and Scotty, I'm with them in Paris. I'm them in, in the locker rooms. Now, all, so the hype goes in, and now I'm I'm now I'm I really build up the confidence. I'm still having pain with my arms. I'm still doing surgeries in my arms, nonstop. But I'm still I'm not missing one day of work. I never quarantined for one second in my whole life. <laughs> I mean, I went to work when because I didn't have an office, but a friend of mine gave me an office. He said, just, you know, I, here, take that corner office, you do whatever you want. And I went there every day at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning. And again, I didn't care whatever work I had to do, I would do it. I mean, but I just want to be busy. And I was passionate. I started rebuilding and building. And I started going in, started hiring a couple of people working with me. And then, uh, then he has not stopped since. So I, I ultimately, in uh, July, when the NBA went into the bubble to, to win the championship, I, I called the NBA and I said, you know, there's no argument that the three most iconic players, I'm not saying they, they're the best players, but they might be, but, they, but, but there's no doubt that the three most iconic players in, in the NBA are Michael Jordan, Kobe, and LeBron. You know, I mean, of course, I love Iverson and all those guys, but, you know, the most iconic cultural-wise are the three guys. And I said, you know, I was in the locker room with LeBron, with, with Michael, I was in the locker room with, with Michael, I never did anything with LeBron when it was in Miami or or or, or, or uh, Cleveland. Or Cleveland, and even though I knew LeBron before he got even drafted, which was in the high school, actually gave me his high school jersey and I made jackets for him when he was in in Akron and in St. Mary's. So I said, how amazing if I just do the championship jacket? If the Lakers happen to win, how great would it be? So the NBA said, yeah, we'd love that. Uh, so they gave me a licensing agreement. Unfortunately, I could not get to the, 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 the get into the bubble because it was so strict. Mm. But the next day when he came back from, from, uh, from Orlando, Rich Paul calls me and said, you have the jacket? I said, yes, he won't cover to come over the house and drop it off. And then I said, well, I'll come in about two hours. He said, no, no, just come now. So I go there and there's a big table. King James in the center, you know, and, and AD with him and all his buddies all drinking and enjoying. That was the Tuesday after the Winter Championship on Sunday. But that Sunday, 
I already had if it's design approved and the jacket's already made, some of the championship jacket made. I posted on Instagram and I had 4,000 comments, I don't know, maybe 100,000 like or 200,000 like. At the time, I, may, I might have, I don't know, a million five, million six thousand, six hundred thousand followers. And uh, I opened a website that night and that, that, that week, flooded over first month, I think we sold probably half a million dollars in, in, in orders, which oh, wow. I didn't deliver one jacket. It was all prepaid. I had half a million dollars in the bank without even selling one jacket yet. Wow. And everything just got like, immediately just flooded back and went back in business overnight. That's insane. And uh, so, and, and, and since then, things are continuing and it's just a building up and being a little bit selective of, of, of some of, and I don't want to offend any brand that I'm not doing with, but, but I got all the big brands involved, you know, like, I don't want to say the name, but then the, the shoes that you're wearing that, you know, the collaborating yeah. with Nike there, but uh, some, that one is dropping in next month, which is mm. going to be the most expensive jacket that they have ever done wow. it's going to retail for 15,000 so jeff oh, hamilton for. times can i say it no oh, okay so jeff hamilton so that's crazy no we have ndas on us so we have that <laughs> uh we do stuff with a couple of uh brands uh i think the fans uh, might uh, like guess italian it. brands oh, yeah, they know they some big that. italian brands um also we can say the names uh one of them we, one one of them is sony the other one is another big uh italian brand uh like you back, for instance, you know, right. that brand, but we don't want to say the name either. <laughs> um, so, um, They're going to get that one too. <laughs> they know what bag I got right now. Um. So, and, and, and then <laughs> I just made a deal with the NFL. I didn't deal with the NHL. Um, we're doing things with Tyler, the creator right now. We did uh, the weekend for the Super Bowl, which was amazing. Now we're working on our next project with the weekend and, and another drop. You know, finally got to, to meet uh, Drake, which was amazing because mm. you know again that's another i i get to meet him i i made the, the retirement jacket of kobe when he wore when kobe retired in 2016 the last all-star game i made a one of one kobe jacket for the for for farewell to mamba it's one of the most famous jackets i've ever made in my career and but I never got to meet uh drake so i you know gigs you know the the the, the, the yeah. british rapper uh, yeah. uh invited me to his birthday and he said, you know, Drake is my best friend and he, Drake is throwing a party for me. That, I know you never met him because through, I don't know if you know AJ, the manager of Dave East, he said, you know, that would be a great opportunity for you to, to meet Drake. So I went there and I turned around and Drake is right there, like behind. And I, I said, wow, I just want to say, Drake, I want to say hello, I'm, I'm Jeff Hamilton. Like, my mind is saying, who that is this guy, you know? But that's not what he's When he back up, he come close, put his arm up, and just give me a big hug, like with his big muscular arm, and squeeze <laughs> me, and start talking to my ear. He said, you don't know what you represent to me. Since I'm a kid, I've been loving your jackets, and I cannot wait for you and I to be friends, just for us to do, to, to go through the archives and so through the stuff that you have. And, wow. and uh, so from there, it came on, we did the the we're on that second OVO uh, a collaboration with his team and we have an amazing relationship with them. So mm. a, a lot of really cool stuff going out right now, a lot of amazing, like we just finished, like I told you, the, the, the Tyler, the creator, the Golf Wang one, uh, we're gonna drop in September uh, and, and uh, amazing, amazing collaborations right now. That's incredible. It must feel right. pretty bizarre to s sort of be at the high of your career so late into your career. It is, and and for me, I mean, it's you know, I I almost like to be like the one of one. You know, I like saying like, how many people can you say that they were sixty fours when they started from scratch and made it back? You know, got on your jumper 64. at sixty four. That's rare. And, but you know, like, okay, <laughs> let, let me tell you, supposed to do that when you're twenty one. But I'm, I'm actually 60, <laughs> I'm actually sixty seven. We're sixty seven oh, okay. next month. Oh, I started better, the company. Yeah. Is he so the I mean, oldest person that's been here? Shit, quite possibly. I don't know. So I, and I, but Boom. you know, I, Adam, you know, I, 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 I don't feel like I'm 67. You know, right. like I'm, I don't. I feel like I'm in my skin. I feel like I'm 30 years old. So I mean, I don't. I act like a 30 year old. I mean, I tell go to, to the yeah. to the clubs and I'll, I'll do the things. I mean, I'll do whatever needs to be done. I'm, I'll be till three o'clock in the morning. I mean, tomorrow night I'm going to Soldier Boy's birthday party. <laughs> um, but before I'll be, wow. I'll be at that an LV event in on Rodeo Drive and you know. But but do you have to pace yourself at this point in your life? Because even myself at 38, you know, I, I feel it where 
I don't necessarily want to be grinding super hard 16 hours a day. Or if I do have to do that one day, I'm probably not trying to do that the next day. No, no. I, no, you I grind as much as I can. Really? I, I look at it as every, every opportunity I have is something that I'm not going to have tomorrow. So I, I want to maximize my potential. So if I can mm. be hustling as much as I can, listen, I, I'll, I'll have time to rest. I mean, I, for me, I, it's important for me to, to do the things that I love and, and, and be always on top of it. You know, it's just... Uh, you, a, you said you was close friends with Mike Tyson. You ever smoked a blunt with Mike Tyson? No, not yet. You know, I'm going to be. I'm doing his podcast uh, oh. soon, but I never did that. And I listen. I, 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 I never smoke with anybody but myself. I, 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 I just, Same. I, I just. Uh, I smoke. Uh, I don't smoke like. Like, like casually like that, I would not. I, I smoke when I, when I go home. I, I really have not smoked, to be honest, for the last couple of months. I have so much weed at home wow. <laughs> because everybody gives me that. I've done stuff with Burner. I've done stuff with uh, all the big guys, you know. But I don't, I don't really, uh, I smoke only at night when I'm at home and I want to relax. But lately, I found out it was making me a little lazy in the morning and wake up with a big head. So I, I, it has to be really, like, like last time I smoked, I was in a... I was in Puerto Rico and I knew I was not going to work the next day mm -hmm. and, you know, I was having fun. So it's okay. It's cool to relax. And, but I would not go out. I would not smoke in a club. I like to, I like confinement of my own room. I got to ask this question. What is your attitude at this point in your life on your own personal, personal sense of style and fashion? Uh, I, I embrace everything. I appreciate everything. I mean, I wear... I, you know, I'm not like that kind of designer that wants to wear only my stuff. You know, I mean, it's a little bit difficult to be honest. I mean, I, when it comes to jackets, I only wear my own jackets except Virgil's. I mean, okay. I, I, you know, when Virgil passed away, I mean, I've, you know, obviously I'm, 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 I'm you know, a big fan of his, and just you know, I think he really broke so many barriers in in, in the, the high uh, luxury brands for him. You know, just for a kid of Chicago to become. Uh, uh, the head of, of Louis Vuitton. It's just an amazing accomplishment. And, mm. and all the, the, the flowers he got while he was alive was well-deserved. And it's just very sad that he went away at 41 years old when there's so much talent right. that was uh, going in. And in fact, I just designed a new jacket. But it's not, I call it a Virgil jacket for me, but it's not, doesn't say Virgil in it. But Virgil seems like somebody who was working as if he knew that he might not have that and much he knew, time. He knew you the know? last couple of years. He, knew, he did, yeah. huh? Mm. So... Uh, and nobody knew that, by the way. Nobody even closer to him didn't know that. So, so my, the jacket I made, I made, a, a, it's not out. I'm going to drop it probably by next, uh, next couple of months. It's kind of a jacket that's a varsity jacket. And I put like L-O-N, long, L-O-N-G, L-I-V, long leave. And I put a big V on the, on the back. And I called the legacy jacket. And I basically kind of like took a bunch of different quotes from different uh, writers. And I created my own. Basically, I, I wrote... Uh, it's called the legacy jacket. So I put legacy and it and I said, legacy. My definition of legacy is uh, planting flowers into a field without having any expectations to ever see the flowers fully bloom. So that's what it is. I mean, you 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 when when you have kids, you know you you you, you want to raise them. You want to do the best for them. You want to you want to groom them in a certain way. You might not see them being married and having grandkids or grandkids, but you want the best for them. It's mm. The same thing when when you do it like something without any it, it it's pretentious and humbling at the same time i don't know how to, to 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 really explain but it's basically you give it when you love somebody you give it without you do something not without an agenda how great it is to, to be good and giving love to somebody a friend or or, or partner or, or family without expecting that they're going to give you something back in return mm. and it's just because it's the goodness of you doing it and and you know knowing that that love that you give or the energy that you put in out there it's going to stand this test of time and hopefully will stand the test of time it's powerful shit yeah i'm not gonna lie to you i got pissed so goddamn bad it's over with baby <laughs> <laughs> jeff hamilton what do you want the people to uh check out in terms of what you have going on at this moment um, basically, you know, like we, we keep, I mean, on my Instagram, that's where I have all my, my action that I do and, and my lifestyle. And it became some kind of a lifestyle where people say, what's the next thing? Are you going to be on a private jet? Are you going to be on a boat? Are you going to be in the Hamptons? Are you going to be in Paris? Are you going to be in a, you know, if I tell you what I'm doing next week, I'm going to make you guys jealous. I'm not going to tell you. Mm. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of like, so people kind of like, 
love the way I, I live my lifestyle, the way I dress, the way I'm out there. And, and, but it's my life. I'm, I'm, I'm maximizing, like I said, my potential. And if it's uh, 17 hours a day to, to be just <laughs> the 16 hours, I'll do it. I don't care. I mean, I, I'll find the energy. I, I don't, uh, I drink a little less. I, like I said, I don't smoke. I mean, I try to eat healthy. I try to, I don't necessarily exercise, but I try to be healthy and I try mm. to do things that, I'm driven by passion and by, by energy, and my, my, my passion just drives me and my motivation. Uh, knowing that, you know, like sometimes, you know, you sometimes you're on, 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 on the ninth inning, so, and I'm not saying I'm 67 is still young, you know, but, but, but who knows? But I'm on like on, on, on the back nine, like you say, right? Or, you know, on the back, that's the way you say it, you know, so uh, that's the right expression. So, so you, you feel like, let me maximize everything. Mm. Let's not procrastinate. If I can do something today that I'm not going to, you know, I just don't want to be pretentious to think that I'm above God in the universe, that I'm going to be here tomorrow to wake up tomorrow to do it. Mm. So if I can do something, let me just do it now. And, uh, and also the thing is, I just don't want to feel entitled that everything I have, I deserve. No, it's, it's okay. I'm, if I have it, I'm lucky. I'm blessed every moment to do it. I'm blessed to be with you guys and, and being able to share my story. And, and hopefully, if I can inspire somebody, or I'm, I don't need, it's not like I'm doing it because I want to sell a jacket, but if I can speak my mind and speak my, my soul, and you can see why, what I feel about life in general, and obviously being a designer in, in the mix, and it can inspire one person, I'm lucky right there. I'm inspired. You inspired? I'm inspired. I think they're inspired too. If they yeah. made it this deep, they're definitely inspired. I've been inspired since I was fucking 10. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Jeff, we appreciate your time for real. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. And uh, if you want to see like everything from, from my stuff, just go on my Instagram at Jeff Hamilton. That, that's where you, you, you follow up all the new collabs and all the new drops and all the new things that we come up and, and, and the lifestyle. And, and you can always hit me on DM. I always answer my DMs. Fire. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Appreciate yes, you. Sir. Jeff Hamilton, No Jumper, T Rail, coolest podcast of the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, Instagram. Like, comment, and subscribe. Nojumper.com if you want to support. Appreciate you.